Amen. Amen. Why don't you greet your neighbor before you take your seat? Just hug and love on somebody. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you would, open your Bibles, your cell phone, your tablets, whatever you have. Take some notes, jot it down. We're talking about building strong family ties. And it's so needed in the church today. It's needed in the world today. As I've said before, there's, a, on, there's an attack on the family. The enemy is really trying to redefine what family looks like. And we just came out of a powerful, powerful family conference. It was absolutely powerful. And we're going to make those sessions available to you. Stay tuned. There's going to be some information concerning how you can get the word that was spoken in that family conference. You can never exhaust on the subject of family ties. There's so much that God has spoken about concerning the family and what he wants and he desires the family to look like. You know, I've you said, you know, we get a license for everything. You get a license to drive a car. You get a license for so many things. But, and then you can go get a license to get married, but you don't take courses before. You know, but to get a, you know, to get a license to drive, you got to go to school, you got to take tests, you got to make sure you don't hurt nobody. But I think you need to do the same thing when you get a marriage license. You need to go, you need to go to school, you need to take some courses, you want to make sure you don't hurt no, <laughs> you don't hurt nobody. <laughs> Hallelujah. We don't want you to crash into somebody else. And so it's the Word of God that gives us the tools necessary to give us the skill sets necessary to have successful family. You know, we do family life based on our culture, based on our upbringing, sometimes based on what we don't want to see, based on how we've been brought up. But God has a plan. Somebody say, God has a plan. Can you turn me down just a little bit? God has a plan for the family. And we want to get our license from God's plan. We want to get God's viewpoint, God's word concerning what the family looks like. And we're going to just, you know, just stuff you full of the word of God to the best of our ability so that we can have successful family and build strong family ties. If you would, open your Bibles with me to Psalms 127 and 1. And I'm reading this out of the easy, ver easy reading version, and we'll look at this again in other versions as well. But it says, if, if it is not the Lord who builds a house, the builders are wasting their time. If the Lord is not building your house, you are literally wasting your time. And everybody wants a good home. Everybody wants to build their home and have a good family, uh, strong re family ties and strong family relationship. But if the Lord is not doing it in the way that the Lord does it, he does it on the word of God. You are wasting your time. There was a story in Genesis chapter 18 where God is looking at what is taking place in the earth, and he's really focusing in on Sodom and Gomorrah and the destruction that is happening with the people and the families during that time. And God, it is so destructive that God is about to wipe those cities from the face of the earth. But God, he looks at... Uh, Abraham, who has a, a certain portion of land, is not that far from Sodom and Gomorrah, but more importantly, Lot, his nephew, is living right where Sodom and Gomorrah is. He's just seeing the destruction of the family and just seeing the destruction of the people every day. And so God knows that Abraham is um, Lot's uncle, so he wants to do something about it. He wants to do something where Abraham is concerned concerning that. And so in Genesis chapter 18, verses 17 through 19, in the New Living Translation, that God says, should I hide from Abraham? The Lord asked, for Abraham will certainly be a great and mighty nation, and the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. And so he said, I've, I've singled him out so that he will direct his sons and their family to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, then I will do for Abraham all that I have promised. In other words, he said, Abraham is going to be a great and mighty nation. And God chose him because Abraham believed God. And he said, Abraham, he would not allow what God has instilled inside of him, what God has put on the inside of him, it would not die with him. 
that he would direct his sons and their families to carry on the word of the Lord God, that God, how God wanted Abraham to be, to walk it by faith, how Abraham wanted to be for his sons and for his family. So he didn't want to hide anything from Abraham. God doesn't want to hide anything from you. You're going to be a great and mighty nation. I believe you are the Abrahams of your family. Somebody said, I am the Abraham of my family. Hallelujah. And so God has given you and I the responsibility to give your families the ways of God, the words of God, so that the things that he is putting on the inside of you won't die with you. That your ceiling becomes your children's floor. And that they begin to build on the foundation in which you've laid in the word of God concerning how they should live. That's what I'm worth waiting for is about building a foundation in the lives of our children so they can know how to conduct themselves. And God has entrusted them with you and your care because he knows that you're going to be a great and mighty nation. I don't know about you, but the Brazelson will be a great and mighty nation. Hallelujah. The house of victory will be a great and mighty nation. So God can entrust the word of God on the inside of us. And that's what he wants to do with all of us. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, David is now king and God has made him a promise as a king that he's going to be great and his descendants after him will be great. And God promised David that somebody would sit on the throne of God or the throne of the kingdom forever because of David's worship and his love for God, because of his faith in God. So David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 Verse 27, he, in the easy reading version, he says, You, Lord, all-powerful, the God of Israel, have shown things to me. You said, I will make your family great. Same promise that he made to Abraham. David grabbed a hold of that promise. And he says, you will, make your, you will make your family great. That is why I, your servant, decided to pray this prayer to you. Lord God, you are God, and I can trust what you say. And you said that these good things will happen to me, your servant. Now, please bless my family. Anybody ever pray that prayer? <laughs> Has God made you any promises in your life? I mean, we've got a lot of promises that God has made us, and we, we want to see those promises come to pass in our lives, but we don't want the promise just to die with us. God, please. Bless my family. He said, let them stand before you and serve you forever. Lord God, you yourself said these things. You yourselves, yourself blessed my family with a blessing that will continue forever. And so we don't want the blessings to die with us. We want them to continue forever. He said, God, you said you'd make our family great. You said a king from our family will sit on the throne forever. God, I receive those blessings and please bless my family. Bless my children. You know, when Pastor Tony and I started in ministry, that was one of the things that we had a concern about, not from God's perspective, but from our own perspective, that we've seen so many people in ministry who go off and do ministry and lose their families, that their children don't grow up to serve God, or they go away from the things of God because they felt like they were competing with their mother and father with God. You can't box God. You can't compete with God. So they just, you know, let it go. But one of the things we want to say, God, bless our children. Bless our family. We don't want our children to go away from the things of God. We want them to serve the living God. And we're still praying that prayer. God bless our family. You said our family will be great. The blessings of God will be upon our family. Then let us see the blessings of God upon our children. And I'm, I'm proud to say that our children love the Lord God. And, you know, they serve the Lord God in the way that they are reaching and ministering to their generation. And so, but that's the prayer for all parents that you want your children to serve God. You want them to live a life that is pleasing to God. I know they'll make mistakes. And don't take it to heart to the sense that you become 
guilty or feel guilty about it, like what could I have done, or maybe I could have said something different, or what, you know, you think about all the things that the enemy puts on you, it's your fault that the way they turned out. If you're doing what God is calling you to do, and you're putting the Word of God on the inside of them, you give them over to God and let God deal with your children. Can you imagine the Father God, the God of the universe, who created all things, who created heaven and earth, the God who created all mankind, his first two kids messed up. Didn't make him a bad father though, right? He's a good God. Your children have decisions to make, but we're going to give them the word. Don't eat of that tree. We're going to give them the word, but they have to make their own decisions. But your prayer is God bless them. And God, that was God's prayer. The blessings of God would be upon humanity and that we would see the promised seed, Jesus Christ, in the earth that will save all of humanity. Where Adam sinned and messed up, Jesus came, the second Adam, and brought us all back to the... F Aren't you glad? Hallelujah. We have a second chance with our God, our heavenly Father. And so here at the end of David's life, David said in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 5, in the easy reading, he said, God made my family strong and secure. He made an agreement with me forever. God made sure this agreement was good and secure in every way. So surely he will give me every victory. He will give me everything I want. Hallelujah. And so God, he made promises to David David held on to those promises, and at the end of David's life, God said he did everything he said he would do. And God made every promise that he has made to David come to pass. And so God will give us his word. He wants to instill the word of God in our lives. This is how you and I build strong family ties. It is through the word of God, not traditions of men, not culture, not the way you grew up in your mama's home, not the things you saw on TV, hallelujah, not the Cosby shows, not Leave it to Beaver, not even the show Family Ties. I mean, not any of those things. Because any of those things, you never saw those kids go to church. Hallelujah. But we see these family shows and we want to be like that. You want to be like the Word of God says. You want to have God's Word. And the only way that you and I can do that is through the Word of God. So in J Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is teaching the Word of God. And because he, you know, you hear Pastor Tony all, says all the time, your starting place will determine where you end up. So he's teaching how you and I need to start with the Word of God. And so you'll end with the word of God manifesting in your life. Every word that God has spoken, it has the power within itself to reproduce itself where it is sent. And God wants to reproduce his word on the inside of you. He wants Jesus to be seen in your homes. Hallelujah. And who he is, the very character, the very nature of who our God is, is seen in Jesus, seen in the Word of God. And so when you grab a hold of the Word of God, you will see Jesus. You will see the love of the Father in your home and develop these strong family ties that God has given us through His Word. So again, Matthew chapter 7, look at verse 24 in the easy reading version. It says, whoever hears these teachings of mine and obeys them is like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. It rained hard, the flood came, and the winds blew and beat against the house. But it did not fall because it was built on a rock. Whoever hears these teachings of mine and does not, and does not obey them is like a foolish man who builds his house on sand. It rained hard, the floods came, and the winds blew, and it beat against the house, and it fell with a loud crash. And so you see that Jesus is making out some really good points in here. And, and one of them, that, that there's rain and there's floods and there's wind. There are storms, there are adversity, there are problems that comes to everybody's house. 
There is no house that is exempt. You can pray fast, read the word, study the word, quote the word, but it does not stop adversity from coming to your house. It comes to everybody's house. And the Bible tells us that it comes to your house so you can know what you're made out of. Hallelujah. Whether the word of God will cause you to continue to stand or whether you would fall, but it comes to everybody's house. And so Jesus promised us success for those who obey the word. Even though the adversity comes, you can still walk in strong family ties or you can walk in success because you use the word of God. He calls it a wise man. Hallelujah. And then he also says that there's failure when you don't obey the word of God. When you build your house on the sand, which is representation of culture or traditions of men or your own way of doing things and your own way of looking at things. Look at Luke chapter 6 in the Passion Translation. Verse 46. He says, what, go what good does it do for you to say, I am your Lord and master if you don't put into practice what I teach you? We, make, we say Jesus is Lord in our homes, Jesus is Lord over our families, but what good does it do for you to say that he is Lord and he is master if you don't practice the teaching that he has given to you? And in your home is where you get to really practice the word of God. Sometimes it's iron sharpening iron, hallelujah. Whether it's you and your spouse or you and your children, but God will give you a, put you in a position where you get to practice the teachings that God is giving us in his word. And so God would allow certain things to take place in your life. So again, so you'll know what you're made out of. We'll look at this in a minute. Look at verse 47. He says, let me describe the one who truly follows me and does what I say. He is like a man who chooses the right place to build a house, and then he lays a deep and secure foundation. He knows exactly how to build his house. He's using a deep and secure foundation. So when the storms and the floods rage against that house, it continues to stand and, and be strong, unshaken through the tempest, for he's built it is wisely on the right foundation. Hallelujah. So here's a wise person. I love the King James Version said he comes, he hears, and he does what God says. So when the storms of life comes, anybody ever been in a storm in your family? Everybody's home has been in some type of storm. But he says, even in the midst of the storm, you will find yourself not in divorce court, but you will find yourself still standing. You know, most people, and I would say most, 99.9% .9 of the people who get married believe it's the will of God. And, you know, I know there are people who've gotten married before you even knew the Lord. But once you know the Lord, how many know that you have a covenant promise of God of keeping you? So it's not saying, well, I didn't know before him. I didn't know the Lord before I got married. So, you know, I made a mistake. No, God knows how to keep you. But here's a wise person that even in the midst of the storm, maybe he's not saved yet. Maybe she's not saved yet. But in the midst of all the storms that come your way, because you are now building on a strong and secure foundation, you know how to stand in the midst of the storm. Hallelujah. Somebody shout amen. amen. <laughs> Praise God. Because it built it wisely, using the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of this world, but the wisdom of God. Verse 49, but the one who has heard my teaching and does not obey it is like a man who builds a house without laying any foundation at all. And when the storms and flood rage against that house, it will immediately collapse and become a total loss. He says, and which of these two builders will you be? Selah. Which of these two builders will you be? Am I going to use the wisdom of God or am I going to use the wisdom of the world or am I going to do things the way I want to do things or the way my mama taught me or the way my daddy did my mama? And they work, they all right, they still together, but they miserable, but they, 
But anyway, here he says, what two builders will you be? Somebody said, I want to be a wise builder. That means that you and I build our relationships. We build our families. We teach and train our children in the word of the living God. James chapter 1, verse 21 in the New Living Translation, it says, So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word of God, the word that has been accepted, the word God has planted in your hearts. But it has the power to save your souls. It has the power to save your family. The word of God has the power to save your life. Get rid of all the other traditions and teachings and filthy um, evil that is in your life and humbly, somebody said humbly, you got to humble yourself to accept God's way of doing things. Humbly accept the word of God has planted in your hearts, but it has the power to save your soul. The word has the power to keep you from going through unnecessary stuff. We don't, the word of God is able to keep you but you want to do God's word and do it his way. He said a man that doesn't do God's word is like a man who looks into the mirror. He walks away and he forgets what manner of man he is. So you got to humble yourself. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, he said God will humble you so that you will know what you're made of. So you will know that man doesn't live by bread only, but we live by what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's how a man lives. We live not by this just natural world and what it has to say, what it's offering us. We live by every word that proceed out of the mouth of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, he says, so he allows you to get hungry, but then he feeds you. He allows circumstances to happen in your family, but then God will give you the answer through the word of God so that you will find yourself in a place that you live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so God wants us to live by his word, receive his word that he has given to us. Look at Isaiah chapter 55. Hallelujah. Somebody said the word of God is important for my family and my everyday living. You got to have word. It's not enough just to hear the word on Sunday and Tuesday. You've got to be a student of the word of God. You've got to go to the word of God when you got issues in life, when you're faced with problems. Don't wait till the problems show up and trying to build on the word then. Because when the rain comes and the flood comes, and they will come, if you already have the foundation laid, which is the word of God, what is God speaking to you? Not what he's saying to your husband to do. What he's saying to you to do, not what he's saying to your wife to do. What he's saying to you to do. You know, I hear husbands say, if she would just do the word, we'd be all right. How about if you just, if you just do the word, if you just do what God is saying, you will find yourself living out the word of God in your life and you will have good success. It, ha it works for every area of your life. Whether you are married or whether you are single, the foundation of God's word will cause you to have fa strong family ties and see the success that God has given to you. Amen? So in Isaiah 55, beginning at verse 8 in the Message Bible, he says, I don't think the way you think. God doesn't think the way you think. And you know, everybody has this thought or fantasy of what life would be like when you get your own family or while you're in a family, even if you're in a family that you don't like. When I get married, when I have my own family, I'm not going to do that to my kids. What my mama did to me. And then when you get older, you say, thank you, mama, for what you did to me. <laughs> I see now. I can see clearly now. Hallelujah. One of my, my oldest son, it was his birthday this past week, and we all got together, and we celebrate all our children's birthdays when they come. And we were sitting down, and we were talking, and he was sharing, and we were just talking about it. He said, I remember when y'all gave me my first car. He turned 16. We gave him his first car, and we were talking about it. He said, I, you know, I, my friends laughed at me when they saw that car. And I said, boy, when I was 16, I ain't had no car. I didn't, listen. 
And I was like, we gave you what we could afford, and we wanted you to have better than what we had. And so what we gave you is what we could afford. I'm sorry if you didn't like a Ford or Chevy or whatever it was at the time. And, it, and we were just saying how we had, you know, looked under the couch. We scraped together every penny, every dime we could find just so we could be a blessing to you. He said, I had no idea. And now that he has four kids of his own, and he's a granddad, he said, I understand completely, Ma. I understand <laughs> what you went through with us. <laughs> he said, thank you. I said, we wasn't getting Thanksgiving back then. <laughs> but you understand, you know, we have this way of thinking that is not like God's way of thinking. And the only way that we can think like God and produce God results is to have the Word of God. You know, as a young girl, you know, you fantasize what it's going to be like when you get married to your boo. And then, you know, you, all these things, and it's, the reality sets in when you get married. But when you have a foundation, which is the Word of God, then you have the abilities or the equipment necessary to be successful in your family, even when things don't happen the way you want them to happen. So the only way that we can shape the way we think is to get the Word of God. We, we spent weeks on developing a kingdom mindset. And so God is saying to you and I again that He doesn't think the way you think. He doesn't even think the way your mama thinks. Or your daddy thinks, unless I'm your mom or your daddy. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. And so we've got to, what is God saying about our families? You know, because everybody has different opinions about how to raise children, what we should do, what's the role of the husband, what's the role of the wife. And it has nothing to do with always the word of God. Sometimes it's just things, again, as we've seen on TV, or things that we think or the way the world has shaped us, the way we think that, you know, the woman ought to cook, clean, have food on the table, do all these things, and the husband, he's just, you know, sit with the remote in his hand. I mean, we got these ideas of what family is like, and we try to emanate these things in our home, and it doesn't work because God didn't create the family that looked like that. You know, I know for me, Pastor Tony and I, we got married. We, had to sit, we were both raised in a single-family home, and, you know, for a while, and so it could look like that in that single-family home that one parent, you know, did everything. And so you get married, and you think one parent ought to do everything. No, we going to share these duties. <laughs> like, I'll do the dishes, you cook the food. I'll do this, you do that. Let's just come together as a family and build a structure or a foundation that our family can grow on. Amen? Why? Because God is not thinking the way you and I think about family. Let me finish this. The way you work isn't the way I work. God's decree. For as the sky soars high above the earth, so the way I work surpasses the way you work, and the way I think is beyond the way you think. Just as rain and snow descends from the sky and don't come back until they water the earth, doing their work of making things grow and blossom, producing seed for the farmers and food for the hungry, so will the word that come I'm ready for a change in 23. Come not my mouth not come back empty-handed, they'll do the work I sent them to do. And they'll complete the assignment I gave to them. And when you put the Word of God in your mouth, it will complete the assignment that God gave it to do. Remember, the Word has the ability to reproduce itself wherever it is sent. And so we send the word of God. You have to know what does God's word say concerning you be a, a husband, a wife, a auntie, a grandma, a great-grandma. What is God's word for your family, for your life, this grace that is on your life? What is God saying about that? Everybody has their viewpoint concerning it, but what does God has to say? As I said to you before, when my son started having his children, he thought I was going to be like his grandmother was, my mom or Pastor Tony's mom. Whenever he needed a babysitter, we would be there. Here's the kids. Look, I'm, I'm not that kind of grandma. <laughs> He's like, well, mom, your mom did it. That was her grace. <laughs> 
I'm not that kind of grandma. I, I'm not home most of the time. <laughs> and so, my, you know, you got to know what your grace to do and be okay with it. No, I love being a grandma, and I love being a great grandma right now. But, you know, it, it, you have to know the grace of God that's on your life. And you have to know what God is gracing you to do. I love the word of God concerning. And so it takes away the guilt and the condemnation off of your life because you begin to walk in a grace that other people don't understand that you have in your life. But it comes from time spent with God in his word to know what he has for you to do in your life today. And so God wants your life, your family to be built on the word of God and building strong family ties. Amen? Amen. Come on, stand to your feet. I want to pray over you and your family right now. And we will pick this up the whole month of August. We're going to be talking about building strong family ties. Amen? And I'm so excited about today because we get to celebrate 19 children who have gone through I'm Worth Waiting For program. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And I'm telling you, if you have any idea what these children have been taught, I wish <laughs> when I was their age that I was, somebody sat me down and taught me the things that they are being taught to help me make the right decisions in our life. How many made some mistakes when you were young? Let, I, let me raise all, both hands, feet, legs, toes, fingers, you know. But if I knew what they knew today, it might have prevented some things. But uh, I thank God for his grace that is so sufficient for our families. And let's instill, reinforce the things that they have learned. We are all one big family. We are victory family as well as your individual family. We have a responsibility to live this word before our children. Lift your hands high to heaven. Father, thank you for the word of God that we've heard here today. It's not new to us. We've heard your word. But God, what good does it do for us to hear your teaching, call you Lord and Master, and don't do or practice what we've been taught? So we thank you that we release faith now that comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. So God... If you don't build the house, we're wasting our time. God, we give our families over to you. God, we thank you, Lord God, for every mother, every father, every son, every daughter, every auntie, every uncle, Lord God, every family member. We lift them up before you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the family ties that we have together. And that is the tie of being tied in the word of the living God so that we can show what heaven looks like and in this earthly realm that we live in. And we always declare that as Jesus is, so are we in this world. God, we give you first place in our family, in our lives, to look like you and to do what you have created and called every one of us to do. And yes, God, we give you praise and much thanksgiving. And let everybody say amen, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to ask uh, Minister John and Karen to come, the McCleary's to come, uh, as well as Minister Elder Georgia Bowie. But while they are coming, I just want to just take care of this. If you're here this morning, you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. I want to give you that awesome opportunity to do so this morning. You know, when you hear words, sometimes... You hear one thing that would trigger something on the inside of you, and it would cause your mind to wonder. First thing you think about is your family life, the way it is now. You think about your family, the way you grew up. You think about the winds and the rain and the storms that have come in your life as a result of your family, and the things that you may have bl blamed your family for. But then you realize you have an opportunity to change your generation. You have an opportunity to change your life. And the only way, the only way that you and I can change our lives is through the Word of God. God wants to show His love, a loving Father, to a generation of people that ha have been fatherless, that maybe you had a father but still fatherless, don't know the love of a real father. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. 
that if you would believe in him, believe what? Believe that Jesus came to give you life. If you believe that, he said, and that he died, took on all the very things that would stop you from having this awesome relationship with the Father, he took your sins, nailed it to the cross, went to hell in your place and mine. God raised him from the dead. And when you receive what he has done for you and I, you get to become a part of a big family of God. And then you get to stand before a holy God without fault, without blemish, nothing that will stop you from coming and, re and knowing the Father as your Father. If that's you this morning, I don't know who's in the service this morning, but before we move on, I want to give you an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Maybe you're here and you want to rededicate your life to the Lord. You said, I, I gave my life to the Lord, but I'm not living. I'm that one, not foolish one. I'm not building my life on the Word. I'm doing my own thing. I'm definitely not thinking the way God thinks. But no shame in that. Just change that by coming and receiving what Jesus has provided for you. You know, the beautiful thing about it, he give it He's given us His Spirit so that when we don't know what to pray, we don't even know what to say, we've got the Holy Ghost that would help us. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues, I want to give you that op awesome opportunity to do so right now this morning. And again, there's an open door. We're a big family of, of God. We're part of a big family. We're just a small part in a big family of God. And if God is asking you or telling you that this is a part of the family that he wants you to be a part of, I'm going to ask you to come as well to be a part of this family of believers, to be a part of the family of Victory Christian Ministries International. I said four things to you this morning. Number one, give your life to Jesus. Number two, rededicate your life. Number three, receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And number four, to be a part of this family of believers. If you would, can you help me talk to somebody around you? Ask them those four things. It's a great time in the service to make a quality decision for Christ in his kingdom. We ought to be praising God right now for what he's doing in the lives of those that are there. God, praise God. God bless you, sweetie. Come on, talk to your neighbor around you. Don't just stand and looking at me. So oh, I know Jesus. Talk to somebody else. They may not know him like you know him. We don't want anybody to leave here like they came. Come on, there's some other people in here that God's talking to. God wants to change your life so your family can change. How I many know it, it starts with you? The responsibility for your family starts with you and your decision to grab a hold of what God has for you in your family. Y'all still looking at me. Everybody said something to somebody? <laughs> if nobody said anything to you, raise your hand. Nobody said anything to you. All right, y'all doing y'all job. Somebody shout each one. Each one. Can we give your God the biggest shout of praise you know how because of these that have come? Hallelujah. Glory to God. What's going to happen? Jesus. Yes, we're ready. Okay, at this time, we're going to commence our I Am Worth Waiting For ceremony. Amen. Yes. Amen. What we're going to do, our minister Karen, she's going to call off all the names. As she calls the names, the parents will escort their child or children to the stage. And you know where you're supposed to be, so we thank you so much for just, just, just being right there. And then what's going to happen once you're in place, our apostle, Pastor Cynthia, is going to read the charge to the parents. I will read the charge to the children. There will be a ringing 
we ask you to put the ring on your child's finger, and then Pastor Cynthia is going to pray over you all, and then the ceremony will conclude. At this time, Minister Karen, do you mind calling the names? Yes, ma'am. Avery and Tori Williams. Caden Terry. Cheyenne and Nyla Carter. Cameron Youngblood. Elijah Smith. Gianni Williams. Israel Bovane. Jameson Benjamin. Jada Reynaldo. Jesse Teniente. Joel Fulton. Khalil Davis. Melanie and Naomi Vaughn. Victory Nix. Vonzel Maddox III. And Zyron Haywood. Let's just unison, give them all a good God bless you. Hallelujah. Praise God. This is absolutely, absolutely awesome. And um, I am so godly proud of all of the parents who have allowed your children to participate in this program. We're instilling in them the word of the living God. And you don't, we don't want the world to do it. We don't want the schools to do it. They have gotten away from the things of God. And so it's important for us to have the word in our children. Thank you for allowing us to do this through this program. If your child has not gone through this program, when it comes around again, you want them to be a part of this. If you got grandchildren, get the children in your neighborhood. You want them to be a part of what God is doing here. I have a charge to all the parents, grandparents, godparents that are standing behind these beautiful children. And it says, the word of God charges us as parents in Ephesians 6 and 4, saying, Fathers, don't exasperate your children, but raise them up with a loving discipline and counsel that brings revelation of our Lord. And when it says father, it means parents. It says, this scripture tells us that one key responsibility in raising our children is that is to reveal Jesus to them. How we love them how we discipline them, how we handle conflict, and ultimately how we live daily our lives reveals Jesus to them. Based on that revelation and its development will position them to make good decisions in life. God did not intend for parents to hold this responsibility apart from him. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit and our revelation of who Jesus is that will enable us to lead and guide our children. On this date, I charge you, August 6, 2023, I charge you not to be a parent with all of the answers, but to be a parent that yields themselves to the Spirit of God for direction. I mean, no, we don't know everything. Our children think we do, but we don't know everything. But we're leaning for the direction of the Holy Spirit, for the wisdom of God to know what to do. Be a parent willing to forgive and quickly ask for forgiveness. Be a parent of prayer, for surely our children need it. And through your prayer, you will experience the peace that surpasses all understanding. Thank you, Lord, for your divine favor and grace upon these parents. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Children, 
this is a charge to you. I charge you this day is to allow God to keep you in your singleness. This is your season to blossom into the wonderful young men and women that God created for his kingdom. As you continue your life's journey, the scriptures state that you are not to be conformed to this world. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, and you are to maintain your body as the temple of the Holy Ghost. The truest test of love is patience. God loves you and wants to protect you. His will for your life has to be much more important than what you feel or think. You've learned that marriage is special, holy, and important to God. Trust that he will give you your heart's desire and your spouse by you being patient and abstaining from premarital sex. Sexual promiscuity produces a host of sickness and diseases, as you learned in class, which is not God's desire for you, his children. You are to maintain strong faith in the Lord to keep you, to keep you, and to keep you in purity as you vow of abstinence you are making this day. We know it might not be easy. You'll have some challenges, but we're believing that you will go forward as you get older. But if you build yourself up in the word of God, amen, and know your identity, it will be easy for you to say no. I'm worth waiting for. I charge you to look at yourself in the mirror every morning and say to yourself, I am God's peculiar person and I am beautiful in your sight. You know every hair on my head. Anything anyone could ever desire in me, Lord, you've already created in me. I am his desire and I'm worth waiting for. The parents that praise God. You know, it was many, many years ago when my children turned 13, um, turned to be teenagers, Pastor Tony and I, we would buy them rings. And we would put a ring on their finger. And it was, we said a lot to them concerning that, but it was our covenant with them. And it was a covenant between them and God to keep themselves and that they would be holy and walk holy before the Lord God. And so it is something that we adopted it, not only in our immediate family, but in our church family, that we will put a ring on our children's fingers. And it's a covenant relationship between them and God and between the, them and us as parents, that they will keep themselves and they would really live it out that they are worth waiting for. And at this time, our par the parents will put the covenant ring on their children Hallelujah. That they will keep themselves holy and pure before God, not allowing anybody to take advantage of them or them take advantage of somebody else, but they will live a holy and pure life before God that they are worth waiting for. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. And not only, may it be a witness, not only to them, but be a witness to their friends too. Why you got on a ring? What is a ring for? That they begin to tell them how they are keeping themselves till marriage and that they're not going to enter in sexual promiscuity and they, they won't do anything that is not pleasing to God in fornication or any of those things. But Again, they will know the beauty of who God created them to be and that they are worth waiting for. If you would stretch your hands toward these children, parents, if you would put your hand on your child and on these children that are here, let's pray and believe God for God's keeping power over their lives. Father, we lift up these children before you, Lord God. You knew them before they were ever in their mother's womb, Lord God, and you sanctified them. You set them apart. You made them meet use for the master's use. And Father, we thank you that you'll use them for your glory, Lord God. And that, Father, we thank you that your hand is upon them, that your keeping power is up on them, 
Lord God, let this ring be a reminder to them of them, you keeping them and them keeping themselves, Lord God. Father, we pray a hedge of protection around about them in the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus keeps them whole and healthy. And we thank you, Lord God. No sickness, no disease will come nigh their dwelling. God, we come against every perverted spirit in the name of Jesus. It will not enter into their hearts or their minds in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But God, you will keep them holy, pure before you, Lord Jesus, as the word have been taught. Father, everything that have been taught to them through these classes, bring it back to their remembrance in the name of Jesus. And God, we thank you for their future spouses, their future husbands, their future wives, Lord God. May they be men and women of integrity that love you, Lord God. And Father, they will realize that they were worth waiting for. Hallelujah. And so, Father, we thank you for your hand that is upon them, for keeping them in the mighty name of Jesus. And let the church and the parents say, Amen, 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 Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Pastor Cynthia. We love you so much. And thank you for allowing us to be able to pour into these children. And at, that, at this time, everyone, this concludes. So I'm waiting for the ceremony. I'm going to ask the children and the parents to please exit the stage the way we practiced this morning. And then Pastor Cynthia will continue on with the service. Thank you so much. Praise God. Come on, let's give it up for our children. Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. I'm so happy and so excited about this. God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, before we are dismissed, I believe the ushers have come and have given you the elements, the communion elements. If you don't have any, could you raise your hands so the ushers can come and serve you? But everyone should have it. There's a few hands up in the front and over where the parents are. If the ushers would come and serve you this morning. Hallelujah. Not only do we plead the blood of Jesus over our children, but over our lives. And our communion elements this morning is a reminder of what the blood of Jesus has provided for us in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Everything that he has provided for us was sealed in the blood and the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus. If you haven't been served, lift your hands up. They're coming. The parents over here need to be served. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. This is a very, very, very special time for us. He says, as often as we do this, we do this in remembrance of what Jesus has provided for us, what's already done. Somebody shout, it's already done. already done. You know, every time I say that, I get so excited about it, but then when you wrap your head around it, it's like, it's so awesome. What God has already provided for us. We go through a lot of things, we believe for a lot of things, but when you realize it's already done, 
Hallelujah. You got something to give God praise about. He did it in the blood, in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. He nailed everything averse towards you uh, to the cross. Everything that will stop you from achieving and receiving what God has for you. He nailed it to the cross. And he rose from the dead to see to it that you and I receive and walk in what he's made available to us. And every time we take communion, it's in remembrance of the finished work of Jesus Christ. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, you and I, and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. He said, do this in remembrance of me because what's happening, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Take, eat. After the same manner, he had taken the cup, and when he had stopped saying, this is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. It is a cup of blessings that you and I drink in. It is his blood being infused in your blood. Remember, listen, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and the blood of Jesus makes you whole. This is more potent than any prescription drug you'll ever take in your life. It will cause whatever's wrong to make it right in your life. The blood of Jesus washed away your sins. It makes you whole. Hallelujah. It brings health and healing, prosperity and deliverance to every area of your life. And yes, even your family. When you do this in remembrance, you make real in the present what Jesus did in the past and it is made available to you and I today. He says, you do this, you show the Lord's death till he comes. Take, drink. Jesus, for the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that we partake of this morning. We thank you for the finished work, Jesus, on the cross of Calvary. And you declared it is finished. We thank you the success of our family is finished. We put it in your hands, Lord God. We thank you for the blood and the body that was shed on our behalf so that we can experience the victory already won. We love you, Lord God, and we thank you. Father, if there's anyone in this building with any infirmity in their bodies, we thank you, Lord God. We believe that your blood right now is being infused into their blood, causing their blood to live in the name of Jesus. We drive out every infirmity, every sickness, every disease, known and unknown to man we drive it out now in the name of Jesus and God we declare that it's by the stripes of Jesus we've been made whole 
God, we come against anxiety of any kind, any mental illnesses, Lord God. We drive it out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All anxiety, go now in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you, Lord God, that your blood has provided all things for us. Any area of our lives where we may be ill or sick or diseased or diseased in any kind of way, we thank you for the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that's making us whole right now in the name of Jesus. Come on and lift your hands high to heaven if you believe you're receiving something right now. God, I believe I receive it right now in the name of Jesus. And we declare by your stripes, Lord God, we were made whole. And if we were made whole, we decree we are whole. In the mighty name of Jesus, come on and raise your hands up to heaven. Praise your God. Bless God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. I don't, if anything was ever wrong in your body, you ought to believe right now you've received something. We can lay hands on the sick and you'll recover. But there's nothing like communing with God, with the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You drinking it in and believing God for the victory that he's already won in your life. Somebody shout, I believe. I receive it in Jesus' name. Lift your hands high. May the Lord God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May God be gracious to you. May the grace and the peace and the mercy of God hover over you and your family. May God answer all of your prayers and give you peace. Shalom in the name of Jesus. Say, I love you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, and with all my strength. And I love my family. I love my neighbor as I do myself. Listen, all of our VIPs, if you will meet me right here, we just want to greet you, take you to a place where we can share with you a little bit more about our ministry. All the VIPs, if you're here for the very first time, if you meet me here at the front, praise God. There are some people here in the front. Who's meeting them? Hallelujah. There are people here meeting you, and they will take you to a place of refreshments. For everybody else, one more time, greet your neighbors, and you are dismissed. God bless you. Praise God. Ah.